On today's episode, James Webb detects alien life, the ISS is in big trouble, and Spin Launch experiences a change in direction. In a potential landmark discovery, scientists using the James Webb Space Telescope have obtained what they call the strongest signs yet of alien life beyond our solar system. The exoplanet K218b, which is known as a super-Earth, closer to the size of the planet Neptune than our own, is also what scientists call a Hycean world, meaning it's covered in an ocean of liquid water and a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. According to data collected by James Webb, that ocean might be teeming with microbial life. K218b orbits a red dwarf almost 130 light-years away. This star is less than half the size of our sun and not nearly as hot. There are only two known planets in this solar system, and our potential aliens live on the second planet from the sun, which in this case is the perfect distance from a star to support life. The James Webb Space Telescope has been observing K218b over the last three years since it was launched into orbit around the Sun. Using Webb, scientists have found signs of an interesting molecule on the planet, and this molecule is only known to be associated with biological processes here on Earth. We've never seen it created under any other natural circumstance. The molecule the telescope found on K218b is known as dimethyl sulfide, which is mostly produced by marine microorganisms like algae, plankton, and seaweed. While the presence of these molecules was previously considered and studied, it's only now thanks to Webb that scientists are able to be confident that it exists. Underwater microbial life is most likely the first to have developed here on Earth, which means that this planet could be in the early stages of evolution and could possibly host other species later on. The study used to find this evidence has been going on for over a year. After scientists first found evidence for the particles in the atmosphere in late 2023, they took various pictures of the planet using the James Webb Space Telescope as it passed in front of its host star. Judging the amount of light that passed through the planet's atmosphere during transit in front of the star, scientists were able to get a pretty good idea of what types of elements and molecules were present. The star is only 2.3% as powerful as our own sun, which means that the large planet has to orbit a lot closer and this makes the experiment a lot easier to conduct. As a red dwarf, the star doesn't drown out as many features as a brighter star might due to its very low temperatures. Taking into account the things we know about dimethyl sulfide here on Earth, they were able to determine the amount of light it would allow to pass through, and K218b proves this method well. After getting one and a half years of extra data, experts are finally able to say with some amount of certainty that dimethyl sulfide is abundant in the atmosphere. One of the authors of the study, astronomer Niku Madhutsudan, told the media, quote, The only scenario that currently explains all the data obtained so far from JWST, including the past and present observations, is one where K218b is a Hycean world teeming with life. However, many have cautioned against drawing solid conclusions that connect this to life on the planet, as no one wants to be making false statements out here. So we're drawing strong connections between the data we have and the most likely explanation, but no one is saying aliens confirmed. Mathieu Sudan also told the media, it's in no one's interest to claim prematurely that we have detected life. So while this is the closest we've come to proving we're not alone, more research with more powerful telescopes will be needed to determine if there truly is life on K218b, or planets beyond. Do you ever get that sinking feeling when you realize your personal info is just out there? Like some sketchy company you've never heard of has your name, email, phone number, maybe even your home address, and they're basically handing it out like flyers at a mall. And yeah, you could try and clean it all up yourself, spend hours digging through data broker sites, filling out forms, sending emails, following up, or hear me out. You could not. That's what Incogni is for. They handle the mess for you, contacting dozens of data brokers, demanding they delete your info, and making sure they actually follow through. It's like hiring a bouncer for your personal data. Incogni doesn't just start the process and forget it, they stay on it, tracking removals and updating you along the way. 
so you can get back to doing literally anything else. And because you're watching the space race, you get an exclusive 60% off when you use the link below and enter the code space race. Protect your data, protect your peace of mind, and make this their problem, not yours. Speaking of life in space, things are not looking so good right now for astronauts on board the International Space Station. Officials at NASA are becoming very uneasy about the future safety of the ISS, even stating that the station has entered the riskiest period of its existence. During a public meeting of the NASA Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, panel member Rich Williams discussed risks to the station's safety. He also delved into concerns about the timeline on the station's deorbit vehicle, which is being developed by SpaceX right now. His worry is that if the station needed to come down prematurely, no vehicle would be available, which introduces significant risks. Williams told the panel, quote, All of these risks are actually a derivative of this budget shortfall and collectively contribute to potential compromise of the low Earth orbit transition plan. Basically saying, if NASA can't keep a big enough budget to maintain the station, these next five years could become a danger. As the ISS moves closer to its expiration date, the probability of a catastrophic failure will increase, and a lack of available resources means that NASA might not be ready when that happens. While NASA has to figure out how to keep the station operational, the biggest problems aboard the ISS seem to stem not from the United States, but rather from the older Russian modules, specifically the Zvezda module. This is essential for providing power, life support, and propulsion for the ISS, and it has been plagued with issues. The structure of Zvezda was originally built in the mid-1980s. It was a backup for the original Mir space station. When Russia signed on to the ISS project, their main contribution was the Zvezda module that had already been in storage for a decade at this point. The Russian segment of the ISS has been leaking since 2019. The PRK module, which is the part of Zvezda that connects it to a spacecraft docking port, has the worst case of leaks on the ISS, which is now increased to over three times what they were in 2019. This has required astronauts to seal off the PRK module while not in use to prevent unnecessary air loss. The cause of this issue is still unknown, but may have been rooted in a poor design choice of the module, which made it weak and brittle to the harsh environment of space, especially the thousands of micrometeorites that hit it each year. The main material of the module is aluminum and stainless steel, both of which have their pros and cons. However, the choice of the weaker aluminum for most of its hull is likely contributing to some of these defects. The leaks also accompany cracks that have been seen in the module, which are still of unknown origin. Russian engineers believe the cracks to have originated due to, quote, high cyclic fatigue from micro vibrations. These cracks have gotten so bad that NASA has scheduled a meeting in Moscow to discuss the issues and hopefully come up with a strategy to combat them. In an event that no conclusion is met, or if something else aboard the station goes wrong that would prevent it from staying in its stable orbit, the ISS could plummet to Earth long before 2030, when its decommissioning is planned. While deorbit is ultimately the goal, in an uncontrollable re-entry, Mr. Williams said, the risk to the public from ISS breakup debris will be increased by orders of magnitude. Overarching all of these risks is a large ISS budget shortfall. And he's not the only person at NASA to have voiced concerns behind the transition, even if the ISS doesn't actually become dangerous. Former Deputy Administrator of NASA Pam Melroy recently spoke at a symposium in which she talked about the risks associated with letting a private company run a space station with people on board. She says, there's some work that has to be done. There's going to have to be harmonization of space law because now you've got a commercial entity involved. She invited the idea that a cooperation between the US military and NASA would be needed to keep the transition both safe and lawful. There is another reason that the ISS needs to remain safe to operate and live on, as NASA needs all the time they can to help guide commercial companies in making space stations, as well as establishing law and order in space. In the meantime, NASA is still actively trying to find a solution to their major leaks aboard the station, as they have said many times.
As a spokesperson of the Johnson Space Center said late last year, NASA and Roscosmos continue to evaluate onboard and ground test data with the primary goal of identifying the root cause, gaining a better understanding of the risk to the station operations, and implementing repairs. They want every space station operation to be as safe and comfortable as possible while posing no risk to the public. Remember that company that was going to catapult stuff into space with a giant centrifuge machine? They're back, but without the space catapult. Spin Launch has finally emerged from a lengthy hiatus with a new business strategy, as well as a new program known as Meridian Space. They are working on a new broadband constellation of communication satellites with the aim of increasing flexibility for large enterprises. Spin Launch's biggest project, known as the Orbital Accelerator, isn't quite a viable strategy as of right now, as the company has allegedly run into several problems with the design. This has led them to the decision to launch the Meridian satellites on a traditional rocket made by a third party, which has yet to be announced. They have already signed a contract with Kongsberg Nano Avionics to produce a batch of these satellites, about 280, which are planned to be launched next year with operations beginning in 2017. These first microsatellites will be launched using traditional means, but the company hopes to later shift to launch small groups into space using their orbital accelerator. However, the accelerator hasn't even begun production, due to a lack of investments, as well as difficulty scaling up their prototype effectively. These satellites would indirectly help this endeavor as they are a proven way to bring in cash as well as large investors. Spin Launch has already demonstrated this as they recently received a large upfront investment from Kongsberg's defense sector of $12 million to get the program off the ground. In return, they will have to pay $136 million once they begin making money from the satellites. Once it is paid off, the company is at a net profit and they can begin focusing on their large-scale orbital accelerator, which is still on the books according to a recent report. Over the last five years, they have been testing a prototype that's one-third the size of the full design. The model works by spinning a small rocket on a large arm in a vacuum-sealed chamber before releasing it straight up into space. The last push is completed by a small rocket, which is significantly cheaper than larger orbital rockets. You can see why this would be a beneficial technology as it pushes down the cost due to mostly reusable equipment. Unfortunately, however, the technology is about as complicated as it sounds, which is hard to design, hard to build, and hard to find funding for, especially since the satellites it can launch are relatively small. This is where Meridian's constellation would come in handy, as it can cover costs for the project until it becomes profitable.